Hi everyone! Thank you so much uh, for following me. I have hit my 2,000 followers goal. Uh, in fact, I've gone a little bit beyond it, uh, which is not nothing here on YouTube because it's been harder for me to get followers here probably than any other app so far. Um, so I really appreciate you being here. It was asked for me to do a, you know, getting to know you type of video, getting to know me type of video. So I've got some of your questions and I'll also just give you some information um, that you might not know about me because I truly have never done um, any sort of getting to know me uh, information for my YouTube family. And if this seems much less put together than my other videos, that's because it is much less put together. I have to work t Saturday and Sunday this weekend, so um, I'm just getting content in the best I can. Okay, so for some reason you don't know, my name is Liz, and um, my name Cosbrarian um, comes from the old days um, of my Cosbrarian account, which was the Cosplaying Librarian. So I, yeah, it used to be a cosplay account, and I still do that sometimes, um, but I've shifted now mostly to storytelling. I am a librarian. I'm a children's librarian. I'm from Rhode Island. I am sort of a cosplayer. I also have a background in costume design in general. I have a background in theater. Before I uh, became a librarian, I was a theater artist. Acting, costume design, and I also did um, education for youth theater. So making fucked up fairy tales and these folktale videos has been a nice smushing together of all of these aspects of me, because I get to share stories like a librarian. I get to act them out uh, like an actor. I get to wear costumes if I want that I pull from my closet and supplies. Um, and I'm not doing them for youth. And that's fine, because like kid stuff is my day job. And this is stuff for my grown up friends. I have been making fairy tale content since February 2021. I started on TikTok there and I only came over to YouTube about a year ago. So some of the videos you've seen, if you haven't been able to tell, are actually stories that I've told kind of a long time ago. Making content is so much work, it's been nice to be able to lean on some um, past videos to share to new folks. A lot of what you'll see in May is some older content um, because I love Asian folk tales and I share a lot of them in May, so I have a bunch from years past to share. Another thing about me that you probably don't know because I never post any content like this on YouTube is that I'm a singer. I'm in a cover band. We do like dance, music, oldies to now. Um, and so sometimes I sing in my fairy tale videos, so maybe you'll get to enjoy that at some point. I'm going to start with some of your questions about fairy tales and about the content I make. Okay, so RVP0209 asked how I find the stories I share. Many different places. I do have a large uh, book collection of fairy tales, and when I first began I did rely on those a lot, especially because I was telling a lot of sort of the standards, Grimm, Hans Christian Andersen type stuff. As my followers grew, people wanted to hear folk tales that maybe they had forgotten about from when they were younger, or maybe they're from a place they don't hear a lot of folk tales from. So then I started to rely a little more on internet searching um, because I did not come to this hobby as an expert or anything. Um, I've been learning as I make it. I've always been enthusiastic about fairy tales, um, but my knowledge was pretty much the, the knowledge that most of us have, and maybe a little extra. So sometimes I find tales from my followers. I'll share what books I have with you in a bit. As far as internet resources, I use the Internet Archive a lot, um, the books that they have to borrow. It's a digital library, which essentially acts like a regular library. You don't have to have a library card for it, but it, um, if they have digitized a book in that collection, you can borrow it for an hour and sometimes up to two weeks. I also have some websites that I revisit a lot. Um, there's a professor named D.L. Ashleyman who made basically an electronic collection of folk tales available. And so that's a great resource for if I want to tell a Cinderella tale for Oops All Cinderella's and I want to find a country I haven't visited. Um, he has some great catalogs in that the type of arrangement. He also has a lot of public domain translations, which I try to rely on as much as I can. Because fairy tales and folktales are really funny in that regard, you know, the, the tales themselves are often in the public domain, but the translations aren't always, and there's a lot of older fairy tales that haven't been translated to English until more recently. And for content I share here, you know, I am sharing it for free, so it's uh, there's a lot more that's fair use or creative commons that I can use for that reason, but when I go for my Patreon, or if I ever did want to write a book, which some of you asked about, I'd have to really make sure that I start with public domain. 
available tales. I did recently get my hands on to borrow, not to keep tragically, um, one of these babies, which is um, the Types of International Folk Tales, a classification and bibliography. And this is a collection of three books that basically has um, cataloged all different types of folk tales. So if you think of like a library and it has the Dewey Decimal System, um, fairy tales sort of have their own Dewey Decimal System, and that's this, um, that's this classification, which we call for short the ATU classification, and that's just named after the, the people who developed it. And what folklorists will use um, these books for is you can look up folk tales by topic and see all the different variants of those tales and where they came from. It's really useful as someone who tells a bunch of different types of Cinderella tales, and um, especially for my series Fucked Up Fairy Tales, because I can look up something like the urine. How, how many folk tales have that in it? And it'll give you some places to look into. Yeah, so for really unhinged topics, it's a fabulous resource. But it's out of print! They're developing the next edition, but oh, it could take so long, um, and like, you cannot get your hands on the last edition, so I have to borrow it from a local university occasionally if I want to take a look at it. And then the other um, places I like to get tales, Sir La Lune Fairy Tales is a great resource. Project Gutenberg is a place that collects a lot of older um, books, so like the Andrew Lang Fairy books are all available there, um, anything public domain. And sometimes I'll just Google, what are some weird-ass fairy tales? Like, Google, Google is nice if you know how to use it. This video is going to be 12 hours long if I keep going at the rate I'm going. Let's move on to the next question. Helen asked, what are my favorite types of fairy tale characters to portray? Villains are pretty much the most fun, because I get to really ham it up. But really the best part about, um, the characters is that I get to play everyone. And as a theater artist, that's fun. <laughs> is it a little self-indulgent? Probably. But if you have a background in theater, you know that you tend to be stereo, not stereotyped, but you, you tend to be typed when you're a performer. And when I was doing theater, I was mostly getting like mom roles or character roles, you know, um, bitches, sometimes villains. So I do like playing the pretty, pretty princesses because no one would ever cast me as one in real life. But as I've gotten older, the character roles are more fun to do. Tomas asked what books or resources I would recommend to someone who was starting to become interested in folklore studies as a personal interest. And I have the perfect thing! This is Folklore 101 by Dr. Gina Jorgensen, an accessible introduction to folklore studies. Now, I actually haven't read that yet, but I have read her other book, Fairy Tales 101. And it's awesome. So I have no doubt that Folklore 101 is as great, and I'll tell you why. The tagline says it's accessible, and that is, like, the number one thing I would say is so great about it. The way that Dr. Jorgensen talks about um, academic parts of folklore studies and fairy tale studies is like you're having a beer with her and she's just telling you about the favorite parts of her profession. She also writes these books in a way that, like, you can skip around and read your favorite, you know, the, the, the topics that most interest you. Or you can read them front to back and get a really great overview of these topics. And I think it's a good place to start, too, because especially if you're interested in folklore studies, that is a huge, huge topic. It goes so far beyond folk tales. Folk tales are just like one teeny tiny part of it. Memes are folklore. Urban legends are folklore. There's music that's folklore. It's just so much. So that might give you an indicator of like what direction you would want to keep exploring. If you know it's the folk tales and fairy tales, then you can get her fairy tale book. And then in regards to fairy tales and folk tales, um, the big thing to keep in mind is you want to try to get good trans uh, good translations of them because a bad translation can make or break a fairy tale. For one thing, it might make it inscrutable, which is not helpful to anyone, and you might miss out on humor or cultural cues or something that, you know, a lesser translator doesn't know about. So here are some of my favorite translators. Okay, somehow his name got torn off the cover of this, but Jack Zipes is a big name in fairy tale and folk literature. This is the complete first edition of um, the Brothers Grimm, and what that means is that this is the very, very, very first um, version of the tales they published. 
And if you've been watching my videos for a long time, you'll know that the Grimm brothers changed their fairy tales a lot over the years, each time they made a new edition. So if you want to see, you know, what it was like when they really, when they were first collecting them, this is a great book to get. Maria Tatar is another expert in the field. In fact, if you've seen um, the episode of Explained on Netflix that's about fairy tales, she's interviewed for it. And she's done a bunch of these annotated collections of tales. Um, so I have her Hans Christian Andersen one. I also have the annotated African-American folk tales collection that she worked on with Henry Louis Gates Jr., who is a, the, the number one person you'll want to look into for African-American folklore. Tina Nunnally, and I don't know if I'm saying that right, um, is also another big name as far as translations go. And of course, this one's been uh, forwarded by Neil Gaiman. So you know it's going to be a good one. Kevin Crossley Holland, um, I have his Between Worlds uh, Folk Tales of Britain and Ireland. Um, great, great, great tale teller. And this is uh, my friend Jürgen, and he did a bunch of German folk tales that have nothing to do with Grimm, um, because German folklore goes well beyond Grimm. And what's really nice about Jürgen is he put these in the public domain. What a guy. If you're interested in indigenous tales, um, Alfonso Ortiz, who edited this collection, and Joseph Bruchak, who's done many collections, are both excellent resources. Howard Schwartz is one of my favorite resources for Jewish folk tales, as is Jane Yolen. And there's a whole lot more where that came from, so I'm just going to slowly scroll over some of my books, and you can pause. But most of these are fairy tale collections, but as you can see, I do have um, some YA uh, retellings of tales, because I used to be a teen librarian, so I have a big love for for that stuff. Helen asked, what is the fairy tale retelling I've done that I'm most proud of? I regret to inform you it is not here on YouTube, but it was my Beauty and the Beast retelling that I did over on TikTok. And I can't really post it here because I did it early on TikTok and I used a lot of like copyrighted sounds over there, so I don't think that YouTube will let me upload it. But it's very funny. I sort of spoofed the Disney version while uh, telling the um, original novella it was based on, which is fucking insane. I will definitely redo it for YouTube sometime, but I have to make it a bigger goal maybe when I hit 5k. But I'll try to make a favorites playlist of what I have available on YouTube so far. Both Helen and RVP asked how long it takes me to create my fairy tale videos, and the short answer is too long. I don't recommend people do it the way I do it. <laughs> I mean, I would estimate that for every minute of video you see, an hour of work goes into it. So a three minute fairy tale takes me at least three hours to do. And frankly, I don't even think that's bringing research and writing time into it because I do write a script for every tale that I produce now. And basically, if you want to know my process, um, I research and write a fairy tale script. And then when it comes time to film, I will do each character all together. So I'll do like all the narration clips first, and then I'll do all of the Snow White and then all of the Evil Queen. And that's just to save time changing between clips. And I'll splice it all together in a couple of photo apps. I like CapCut and I like Splice. And then they all go into the world. Petal Pockets asked if I would consider writing my own fairy tale book for adults or children. And the answer is maybe. I'm working on a book query for a book of fairy tales for adults. Um, it's just, I've just started working on it though. So I don't have more information than that. I will say it's intimidating. At this point, I wouldn't do a book for kids because I really try to separate my content creation life from my librarian life, mostly because if you've seen anything about libraries these days, the, the climate is rough. <laughs> and I wouldn't want like someone to think that I was like trying to pitch what I do here online to like the kids I work with, because I'm not. I'm, I think I'm very clear that my content is not for kids if parents show it to their kids. That's on you guys. I'm glad you have a good time. I don't mind. My mom probably would have shown me stuff like this when I was a kid. Um, but, you know, I can't condone it. Um, so if I do any books, it would have to be tied to this persona. So they would have to be for adults. If for some reason writing took off for me, yeah, I would definitely consider doing kids books. Um, but it's really hard. I think writing a kids book is probably the hardest type of book to write. I was at a diner the other day and some lady behind me at the table behind me was like, well, Jared just published a children's book. So I thought, why can't I, if he can do it? My only thought was like, I don't know, can he and can you and should you?
It's not, it's not just like write an easy book. That was a little sassy of me. You should write what you want to write. Okay, so now I'll address some librarian type stuff because people are usually interested in that. So to become a librarian, at this point, you do need to go to grad school. There's no undergrad equivalent of a degree for a library person. This isn't to say that everyone that works at a library has their master's degree. Like most professional organizations, there are the people in charge. Those people will have their degree, their master's degree. But then the support staff, usually you just have to have be a high school um, graduate. I considered going right into library science um, when I was graduating high school because the library was a really important place to me when I was growing up. My parents were divorced. Um, they both had to work a lot. So the library was right up the road from school and I spent a lot of time there. So, uh, so yeah, I was considering being a librarian, but I was also into theater. So I decided to like shoot for the moon first. And then when I realized I wanted to make a regular paycheck, I thought, maybe I should try libraries because I did want a job, like a, a day job that I cared about. Um, and I still uh, cared about books and, and being a librarian. So uh, luckily that worked out. I will say though, if you want to become a librarian and um, you're not a people person, you really need to consider it um, because being a librarian these days isn't like sitting in a nice quiet room reading a lot, it's a public service job. So you have to like working with people or at least be able to tolerate it with a smile on your face. Rowdy84 had a very interesting question. They asked, if I could rewrite any kids or YA or adult book, what would it be, you know, in order to put my own spin on things? And this was a tough question because like, I'm not the, like, part of me was like, maybe it would be like The Secret Garden because that's a book that I loved as a kid. And I read it now and I'm like, this book has some problems. There's some racism in it. And I would love that story to be retold without that aspect. But I'm also not the type of person who thinks you should like censor, censor. <laughs> I'm not the type of person that thinks you do like republish those books by Rodal, for example. Um, I think it's fine that they did it. And I think it's nice that there are kids who can read those stories without being attacked by his sexism and anti-semitism that is present in some of his old books but i i would rather people endorse new writers and like leave the classics where they are and we get some new stories in here but then i thought of my answer ha 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 and it would be the scarlet pimpernel <laughs> by the baroness orksy which if you don't know is this like early 1900s classic novel um which inspired later stories like Zorro and Batman even like Batman and Scarlet Pimpernel are the same story it's about a rich guy who sees an injustice happening and because of his mommy and daddy issues decides to become a vigilante and save people and the people he is saving is are <laughs> aristocrats from the reign of terror which yeah, I don't know if that sits right these days but also the Reign of Terror, like, they weren't just killing aristocrats at that point. They were, like, killing anyone that disagreed with them. So I like to think of the Scarlet Pimpernel as being like, all right, you've gone too far. The Scarlet Pimpernel dashes in to save you from being beheaded because you accidentally said something to piss off Robespierre. How I would change it, though, the novel is sort of focuses on the Scarlet Pimpernel's wife. Spoiler alert. You don't know that at the beginning, except that you fucking know it. So yeah, so the story's about Marguerite, who is married to this guy, Percy Blakeney, who's like the Bruce Wayne, and their marriage is estranged, for reasons I won't get into. Um, and it's basically about her figuring out that he's the Scarlet Pimpernel, this guy that everyone's talking about, who's been saving people um, from France and bringing them back to England. So if I rewrote it, I would want to make her less dumb. It would be more about her as a French woman, because she's a, a French woman that, that marries Percy, about that, like, complicated... Uh, aspect of being someone who comes from France who at one time supported the revolution and when it changed for her. And I would also want to bring in a lot more of the feminist history with the French Revolution because there's some cool stuff there. It's a pretty fun book if you haven't read it. Um, there's a ton of movie adaptations. The Leslie Howard one is pretty good if you like old movies, um, but my favorite is the 80s one with Ian McKellen as Chauvelin the villain, um, and Jane Seymour as Marguerite, um, and Anthony and Andrew? What the? No, not Anthony Andrews is not the right thing. I don't remember the guy that plays Percy, but he's great. And there's a musical that got me into it to begin with that I love. My last question is from RVP, and it is about how I felt about Missouri cutting all funding to their public libraries. Now, since then, 
they've backpedaled a little bit. It looks like the legislation they're putting forward is that libraries could lose their funding if they provide materials or programs deemed inappropriate for young people. And what I think is, that I think that fucking sucks. For one thing, it's a small minority of people who think things like LGBT issues and race issues are inappropriate for children. And you can't say something is inappropriate for children when there are children whose lives are being affected by those issues. I have kids who come to my library. I can think of several families with um, parents who are same sex. So yeah, I'm gonna have books with gay people in them um, so that they can see people who are like their parents. And because being gay doesn't mean being rated R. I'm sure I'm preaching to a choir. And you can't say that issues about race are inappropriate for kids because their kids aren't all white. And I don't even think these people making this legislation has any fucking idea of how annoying it's gonna be. Because if someone can come in and say that an LGBT book is inappropriate for kids, I can come in and say that a biography about President Trump is inappropriate for kids. Because he has been accused of sexual assault and because he makes fun of disabled people. And I don't think I would like kids to read and celebrate that. But I know there would be parents who would be pretty mad if I got rid of all of the Trump books in my library. So yeah, in case you couldn't tell, I'm a progressive. <laughs> and if you don't like it, get the fuck out and don't tell me because I don't care. That's as spicy as it's going to get here. Okay, that's it for my questions, though certainly if you all think of questions um, that I didn't address, I can definitely do a follow-up video. What are some other things you might like to know? Um, I'm a cat person, but I love dogs. I'm a coffee person, but I'll get down with tea. My personal favorite fairy tales are Aller Lyhrow by Brothers Grimm, The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen, and The Happy Prince by um, Oscar Wilde. I have done all of them on YouTube. I have a serious relationship. Um, my gent's name is Dan. He's an art teacher at an elementary school. Uh, so we get along great. Um, I bite my nails. I have chronic back pain and I am on antidepressants. So if you ever feel like, wow, Liz really has everything together. D I don't. I, I'm a, I'm a human. There, there's a lot going on here and I got bad days too. Uh, what you see online is a facade for everyone. Though I do think these days people are being more upfront about this type of stuff and that's really nice. My favorite Disney movies are The Little Mermaid and Sleeping Beauty. I know, I know, I know they're both problematic. I don't know what to tell you. The scene when the fairies make stuff without magic is the greatest thing Disney has ever made. I love so many kinds of music, but jazz standards are probably my favorite. Stevie Wonder is also another one of my like super faves. My hair is not a wig. People do ask me that. I do get compared to Caitlin Doty all the time. She's not gonna do a collab with me all. I'm sorry, she, she's too busy. And if I had to pick a meal that I would always have to eat, it would probably be pizza. But sushi, it's right behind. Sushi is right behind. And I know I should really pick sushi because I'd be a lot healthier. I hate cooking. There you go. Now you know me better. I'd love to get to know you if you want to share some information about yourself in the comments. Thank you for being lovely. I always hear that YouTube is terrible, that people are terrible on YouTube. And I guess the upside of having a little following here is that you're all great. If you're still here, thanks for watching. And I'll see you soon.